Welcome to the Core Women Podcast, the place for women entrepreneurs, authors, and self-starters looking to build community and gain valuable insights through expert interviews with women at the top of their game. Join your host, podcaster, producer, expert coach, entrepreneur, and author, Dr. Summer Watson, as she aims to inspire and empower you through these candid conversations. Lean in and embrace the journey. It's time to start the show. Here's your host, Dr. Summer Watson. Today on the show, I'd like to welcome Wendy DeRosa, who is the author of Becoming an Empowered Empath, the founder of the School of Intuitive Studies. She has been helping people develop intuition and experience personal transformation for over two decades. Wendy is a popular faculty member at the Shift Network and has filmed two programs for Mid Valley's Spiritual Growth Channel. We have so much to talk about, so let's dive right into this, Wendy, and welcome. Thank you so much for having me. Wendy, I'm so excited to speak with you today about your new book, your journey, and passions. I would like to start the conversation off by asking you to give us a brief glimpse of your personal background, how aspects of your journey may have supported the development of your lived experiences in being an empowered empath. Great. Yes. So I was, um, I was raised on the East coast in, in Connecticut and in a big Italian family I was the oldest girl of eight children. And, um, very young, I started to develop a lot of signs of overwhelm, oversensitivity. I mean, now I have language for it. I was intuitive and empathic as a child back then. It was just, um, you know, it was overwhelm. It was anxiety. It was depression. By the time I was, eight, no, sorry, by the time I was six, I was gaining weight. By eight, I was developing signs of depression and anxiety. And I just, I absorbed everything that I was um, immersed in, responsibility, caretaking of my younger siblings. I went to work at 12 years old to start paying for bills in the house. And you know, just really didn't have much of a, of a childhood. And, and um, you know, in sort of an, I don't know, probably typical or normal way. And I, um, by the time I was 19 years old, I had had a nervous breakdown and out of that nervous breakdown, I, I also had this calling from within that I had to get away from whatever it was that I was, you know, raised in it. To me, it was a whole experience, a whole profile of something I needed to escape in order to, um, I don't even know what, find a sense of freedom, find something. And so um, back then there was no internet or at least there was no social media. It was just sort of magazines and things you saw around. And I'd seen this call to Colorado or this, this these pictures of Colorado. And I thought I, I need to go there, there. I'm going to, you know, find my next step. And so I felt this inner calling to, to sort of leave the East coast and find, you know, pursue and try to understand what's going on. And I talk about a, in my book, a, in a divine intervention that happened on the way there, but essentially I found a healing teacher and uh, an intuitive teacher. And she helped me understand that what I was experiencing, I'm not crazy. There isn't something wrong with me. I am highly gifted as an intuitive and I need to understand more about that because where it was debilitating me, I could be turning it around and helping other people. And so I studied with her and trusted my intuition and evolved into healing practice and then running the school. And I'm giving you a fast forward version, but yeah, books yeah. later and programs later. And yeah, it's wow. turning my gift into service. <clears throat> that is terrific. Now, let me ask you. So when you got to the point of, I need to go, I need to get out of this. Was there a breaking point at any, at any time? Well, I had, you know, I had this nervous breakdown in college. It was a third semester and I, you know, it was at the point I was such a responsible person, you know, yes. <laughs> I didn't mess up on much in my life, but I was, you know, I was carrying a lot of, you know, trauma mm -hmm. and I, I had this nervous breakdown and, and at the time they put you, you know, they wanted to put me on medicine. They did. I mean, they put me on Prozac and I was like, I, I just need someone to talk to. I don't, I don't know that I needed this. And, and so there was this one day and I talk about this in the book where I met this 
um, my roommate and I were deciding, do I stay here and finish my semester? Or do I forfeit tuition? What do I do? Yeah. You know, and, and so I, we were walking in Boston. I was in school in Boston and I, I met a, uh, there was a street performer, musician on the side of the street. And he was, he was, he stopped us. So, I, you know, we had been having this conversation. Do I stay or do I go to Colorado? Yeah. And he stops me and he says, would you like to hear a song for some spare change? And, and we said, no, and that's okay. <laughs> and we were going to continue to go. And he said, um, no, Wendy, you need to hear a song. And he stopped me. So he sings the song home on the range with the Buffalo roam. One day you're going to get to Colorado. And he says, Wendy, it's not your time to go yet. Hang in there. You're going to get there. And he gives me a kiss on the cheek and he vanishes behind me, like darts off behind me. And my roommate, and I look at each other and look back and this guy is nowhere to be found. Wow. And we knew, I mean, in that moment, I knew, I knew he was, we knew he was an angel. We knew we were in shock. We were giddy, but I was having this healing transmission on the street in Boston <laughs> where my anxiety had healed. Like, I mean, literally it all lifted and I, and I felt like I was giddy. I had enough stamina to finish the semester. I did leave, but I, I had enough yeah. to get me through. And, and that is when I, I, you know, I started to pivot and move towards, I knew like, this is where I needed to go. This was my next step on the journey. And um, yeah. Oh, wow. What a great story. And that just gave me chills all over. <laughs> I mean, really, to look back and go, <laughs> there they go. <laughs> so I love the subtitle of your book, How to Clear Energy, Set Boundaries, and Embody Your Intuition. Can you give a snapshot of what it means to be an empowered empath versus an em empath? Because there, there's a yeah. difference there. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and sometimes, so... Sometimes with the definite, so the definition of an empath is someone who feels the energy of other people through their sentient body, whether it be an interpersonal in one on one connection in, in our life or whether it be the energy of the collective or the energy in a space. So someone feels the energy in, our, in their body. What often sort of gets jumbled in with being an empath is I'm an empath. Therefore, I take on the energy of others. When in fact, that is overly empathic. The empath feels the energy and, and has, their, has, a, has that sentient sense, but there's a point in which that energy crosses into our energetic system and we take it on as our own. And that is actually the overly empathic experience. Mm -hmm. And so, so I just want to separate out those two pieces. And then there's the empowered empath that I had talked about in the book is how are we, how, first of all, how we are gaining an awareness of what's happening in the interior of our energetic body through our energetic anatomy. Mm -hmm. So that's a big piece in the book. And by understanding and knowing what's going on in our energetic body and why we are absorbing that energy, we start to shift from embodying more of our presence and our power and that our boundary strengthening comes from our, I'm going to call it our radiance, but that part of that is living our gifts in the world and, um, you know, finding our true self or, um, you know, sort of trusting our intuition and showing up in the world in powerful ways. Those are very boundary setting because it requires us to take up space and operate from service and from our a deeper, fr from our soul, ultimately, so that the inner boundaries for the empath comes from you know, that inner presence and therefore the outer boundaries are, are, are protected or stronger. And that's the empowered empath. Right. I really can appreciate that explanation and just breaking it down that way, because many times when we think about, and we may not even think about it in terms of giving away our energy, but when we do have all this energy, a lot of times we don't even know how to one, recognize it, hear it, understand it, and then 
to think we have these inner boundaries because a lot of times we've been conditioned to think, give it away, give it away. You need to nurture, you need to other people. And we forget that we need to nurture our inner soul, our inner energy and how we give that away or how we present that to the world is a choice. And so I really do appreciate that explanation because it says so much and it really does feel more empowering. Mm -hmm. So there is so much I love about this book, but chapter nine is really incredible. The influence of trauma on your empathic intuition. Can you speak to this? Yeah, absolutely. So, and you said an important word, you said conditioning, which I I just want to name here in the, in the energetic system, which is that we have, I'm going to say a few things about chakras. I'm not going to go through the whole system, but I talk about chakras in the book and it's because chakras are part of our energetic anatomy, which underlays the nervous system and underlays the physical anatomy. We don't learn that in school. And so we're learning to recondition ourselves when the conditioning we received, nobody was really paying attention to the energy and how emotional energy impacts children, how physical energy does, how silence does, how secrets do, how abandonment does. Like we, we were not, ra- oh, I'm making big generalizations here, but typically we were not raised with that type of um, sensitivity or understanding of the impact to children. In the energetic anatomy at the base of the spine, we have this very overlooked an incredibly important power center called our root chakra or our first chakra. It's located at the tailbone and it's never a power center we think of because it's not a feeling power center, yet it houses an incredible amount of conditioning. We've gotten a lot of conditioning that, that something is wrong with us because something doesn't feel right out here. You know, we start to internalize that. We've internalized a significant amount of beliefs about ourselves based on our sense of safety and survival in our environment. And if it wasn't safe for any number of reasons, we can go down a long list of why we might not feel felt safe inherently or innately and, and had a sense of belonging, then what ends up happening in the energetic body is that the root chakra contracts. And whether we want to think of that as a, it can be considered a trauma, whether we want to think of it or not, it's like that I disconnect from my inherent sense of safety and okayness in myself. And there isn't enough life force, prana, which is life force, vibrancy, grounding in my root element of my body, my tailbone into the earth. So what happens in the body, and this is also a trauma pattern, is that the second chakra, in, which is the, the power center right above it in the pelvis, pow, it is the power center for empathic intuition. It feels everything under the table. It is the feminine, it's the subtle it's in tuned with the subtle currents of what's going on and that's its job. But when there isn't enough flow at the root chakra and there's fear contraction here, second chakra has to compensate. Mm-hmm. And the way it compensates is it blows open and it starts to feel what everybody else is doing. such a track everyone else because it's looking, we're looking inherently for a sense of safety. Mm-hmm. So I start to develop the pattern very early on that it's I need to emotionally take care of everybody else around me, disconnect from my own feelings, my own emotional needs, just so I can be good, hypervigilant, keeping the peace, I can be, you know, sort of over caretaking everyone else around me. And that is the pattern in the body that repeats itself over and over again for empaths throughout life, whether or not from the waist up, we want to be doing that. It's like a whole operating system below the belt that is just doing it because the conditioning that we got at an early age is that our survival depends on our hypervigilance. Well, thank you for that explanation. I love 
the systems approach here in relation to the body, the energy, and the conditioning. I talk about conditioning a lot because it is what has been modeled for us, what has been learned, what we take into the world, what we give back, what we model back until we start to recognize this isn't necessarily working for us. Um, this isn't aligning with something else I talk about often is my values. And a lot of times people don't recognize this because it's been generational. It's been handed down and cyclical in regards to modeling. And so they forget that it's like, there's something else out there. There's a different way of approaching this to understanding that energy, that um, your body, you know, we overlook so many things in our life. We overlook our power of choice. We overlook how our body is feeling. So if we get like a little tinge somewhere, we're like, oh, it'll just go away. But do you realize that that potentially might be your body speaking to you and saying, hmm, I'm giving you a little tinge of a little pinch right now, just to let you know something's starting here. And we ah, push it aside, push it aside, push it aside, like our energy, push it aside, push it aside, push it aside. And like you said, everything's happening below the waist, right? And it's like, there's some big things going to happen here pretty soon, folks, because I'm going to let you know, if you keep pushing me away and pushing it away and not listening to me, there's something that's going to happen because your body is going to respond. I love that explanation. Absolutely. Thank you for that. So there are so many incredible empaths in this world, making a significant impact and change. One of those being the young Greta Thunberg. So how does somebody like Greta, having started her environmental activism at such a young age, not take the world on her shoulders and not become overwhelmed or have it impact her energy in a negative way? Empaths are not only sensitive to their cause, but to all those around them, as you said. So what would you say to such a young empath starting her journey? Yeah, you know, I, it's interesting. I read her mom's, and her mom wrote a book. And so I read, an, I didn't read the whole book. I read an excerpt from the book. And her mom talked about um, how difficult it was for Greta is on a social level, that there was some, you know, spectrum Asperger's mm -hmm. going on. And those are, empathic and oversensitivity like that that is a condition that co coincides with oversensitivity and being empathic mm -hmm. is what I mean so what she talked about in the book is the second Greta started to tune into it started to listen to herself in terms of I need to go out there and sit on this corner and, and I don't even know why, like, I, I don't care who, di who did it. She had her sign and she sat there and she said that it was the first, the mom said, it's the first time I saw her shift from the inside, like her, her I'm rephrase, paraphrasing, mm -hmm. her power came into herself because she started to feel a sense of purpose mm -hmm. in the world where she was consumed by the hopelessness and helplessness of the environment in the world and the, the adults in this world who were not, you know, were not taking responsibility for, for our global warming situation. And so I always encourage young empaths to turn towards their innovation and their creative resources or creative expression. Part of the reason is the second chakra region of the body is a very, very emotional power center. And it's the power center for being an empath. Empaths have strong second chakras. They can mother the world. They can take care of people. They can, you know, they, they have an inherent, innate, powerful way of thinking about other people and having empathy. What happens is we all, most of us, Again, I'm making broad generalizations mm -hmm. here. Most of us have been raised in patriarchal systems where this power center has been shamed and we've been told we're wrong, vulnerability is not okay, men should not cry. I mean, we can go down the list here. So we've inherently disconnected from this power center being inherent, innate, you know, necessary for our existence. And we've lived with the sense that it's dirty, it's wrong, it's shameful. And so for young empaths, 
for all empaths, but particularly when we're developing, it's important that we do start to allow ourselves to have the feelings. We have permission to feel our feelings. That drops us into our body. We're not shamed for our emotions, or if we have them, we're switching that conditioning Mm -hmm. and giving ourselves permission to feel it. That we're turning to our, our sensitivity, our sweetness, our creative resources, finding creativity through writing, journaling, art, music, dance, or sometimes it's just a a creative ideas. Like I'm just going to build something. And and so that we start to really nurture that second chakra people need to explore the fact that they will never fit into the patriarchal box. They have to trust their intuition, their gut, and they will break molds. That's part of being empowered as an empath. And so for the young people, how can we support them in who they are and what their ideas are and start to create, tell them, you know, hold space for them to manifest into the world what's possible. Right. Thank you for that explanation. I think it's really important that people hold on to that suggestion because even from a clinical aspect, young people don't necessarily cognitively want to express themselves verbally, right? So that cognitive work that we work a lot with doing stuff with adults doesn't necessarily work with young folks, children. So what they have to do is they behave, right? They behave a certain way to show us how they're feeling. And so when you say things like be creative, go dance, draw, all these things are necessary, necessary to expressing and allowing that energy to flow and also getting alignment and feeling that if this is okay, I can do this and I can be who I am and be that creative and be that empath and have these certain ways of expressing it and also going through the world, making yeah. their way through the world in a way that's harmonious. So. I, I have one piece to add here to so I have a six year old who's yeah. empathic. Right. Um, and one of the shifts, I mean, I've, I've taught this a lot and I'm also living it yes. <laughs> as a parent, which is that when empaths have learned throughout their life to navigate the unspoken and to be very confused in the unspoken, meaning no one's naming their experience for them. And so particularly around emotions, we've been shamed and punished for having emotions when in fact, sometimes maybe if someone could just say, oh, you're angry, you know, and naming it for them and giving a voice to that emotion. For my child, she feels everything. And then sometimes in her confusion of feeling everything, she'll react in an angry way. But if I were, I could punish her for her behavior of how she's acting out of anger, or I could turn to her and say, honey, you're angry. And it's okay. If you're angry, I get angry. Dad gets angry. We all get angry. And what can we do here right now for you and your anger? Do you want to take some deep breaths? Do you want to take some space? Do you want to rip up that piece of paper? What do you want to do when you're angry? So part of it too, for young empaths is that we are teaching empaths as adults, we're teaching young empaths how to have their emotions as opposed to punishing their behavior for the emotions that they're having. And I get it as a parent, this is hard. It's hard to flip the switch in the moment when like, you know, the toy truck goes running across <laughs> you. I have empathy for the parent, for us parents, but, but it is, it, it is starting, it's us because we as parents, as children, we've disconnected from understanding how to have anger. And instead we might have fear when we get angry because we were told that having the anger is bad and wrong. So I'm bad and wrong. I'm feeling shame and fear instead of actually just having the authentic feeling that I need to be having that, that sort of layered emotional component for empaths that's overwhelm. Mm. And so empaths get overwhelmed very easily because we have our own stacking Mm. of unprocessed emotions that we also need to give ourselves permission to feel and have. Right. Absolutely. I love that you gave specifics about one naming it 
and then going on to the next step and going on to the next step and, and saying, yes, you're angry. And rather than being reactive, how are you going to effectively respond to this? And there's, there's a distinct difference between reactionary and responsiveness. So, and I see this all the time. I see this with adults constantly. So it's what we've learned, as you said, it very, goes very deep. It's almost like DNA we're born with DNA, but how we express that DNA is very, can look very different. So, and that's, that's due to the lessons that we've learned. That's what we put in our body. That's how we exercise our body. And that's where we get a different expression. And so you're saying some of the things in different words to this point. So I'm going to go to the next question. If there were three points you want people to walk away with after reading your book, what would they be? For one, uh, as simple as this sounds, trust your intuition. I mean, it truly is the light of your soul communicating through your body. And, And the more we evade it or turn away from it, the more powerless we can become, the more frustrated we can become, the more overly sensitive we can become. So tune into your intuition, trust yourself. I also believe that empaths are leading the way in our consciousness evolution. I mean, we're shifting from non-transparency, sort of patriarchal system to finding more connected ways of being with each other, supporting this planet, working together, having empathy and vulnerability and truth. We're on a deeper aspect of truth. And so as, as, as much as it can feel like a curse to be an em- empath, you know, I do believe that as you turn to your inherent truths, then you're going to be, you know, leading from a different perspective inside yourself. I also want to leave you with the awareness that your voice is powerful as an empath. The more you vocalize your experience and be able to say, I am feeling this right now in this moment, I need to separate out what's mine and what's someone else's. Like the more we start to vocalize and even things like this is my energy or I'm feeling this way, is that what you meant? The more we use our voice to clear the air for ourselves, the more we are starting to reparent the part of us that had to navigate a really soupy, messy, unspoken, and overly empathic experience. Mm, I love the way you put that. So as I said, I love the subtitle, How to Clear Energy, Set Boundaries, and Embody Your Intuition. When you talk about becoming an empowered empath, I think we all have this, a level of empathy, right? So we can all be an empath to a certain degree, but I also feel like people who read this book, who aren't in touch with their empathic side will become more in touch with that empathic side and know how, and know that it's okay. Yeah. Not only those who are very sensitive empaths, but also those that don't aren't in touch with their empathy. Yeah. So it works both ways. And this, there's some great strategy here. So I love that. Thank you. And I just want to add, if anyone does not identify as an empath, they can get something out of this book because we live in a world today where everybody is feeling something, even if they don't identify as being an empath. And so the tools in the book will support people across the board. Yeah, absolutely. Wendy, absolutely. You know, we are human. We are social beings. We are human. We're all human. So we all feel certain ways, how we feel those and how we identify and recognize is significantly different, but yet we all go through similar things. We're not as different as we really think we are because we are human. So we feel that sadness and that pain, and but yet how we are in tune with that and how we feel that looks differently. And, and, and there's levels of how we even recognize it and then are able to fill it. So books like yours are so great because it brings that brings attention to areas in our mind, body, energy that maybe we didn't have that awareness of. Yeah. So thank you for that. So can you tell us a bit about your school of intuitive studies? 
Yeah. So I offer programs and trainings in developing intuition and becoming a healer in personal healing. So whether you need healing and would like to come and, and, you know, we either work with a healer or receive a monthly healing from me through my divine healing inner circle. That's one, one piece, whether you're looking to develop your intuition, I have programs. And if you're looking to get certified as a healer, I also run a year long training. Oh, fantastic. Thank you for that. So as we come to the close of the interview, my last question is, if you were to leave the listeners with some words of wisdom, what would they be? My words of wisdom, repeating a little bit of what I said earlier is to trust your intuition. As simple as it sounds, it is the power within you that is guiding you to understand more about your experience of life and to show up in the world and be of service. And it is the part of you that needs your attention. The more we tune into it, the more we expand, the more our boundaries strengthen, the more we show up in the world as an empowered empath. Thank you, Wendy, for joining me on the Core Women podcast today. Thank you so much for having me. Absolutely. If you would like to connect with Wendy DeRosa, you can find her at www.schoolofintuitivestudies.com and wendyderosa.com or on her publisher's page at New World Library. And you can purchase her book online and at most retailers such as Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and Target. Thank you for joining us on the Core Women Podcast with Dr. Summer Watson. We're so glad you're here and would love to connect more with you. Find us on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube at Core Women and on Twitter at Core Women One. For more about Core Women and Dr. Watson, visit corewomen.com. Want more support and resources for amazing women like you? Great. Join Dr. Watson and Jen Fontanilla at the Life, Love, and Money Collective, a Core Women production that aids in understanding the key traits that might be getting in the way of living a life that you are absolutely passionate about. Connect with Summer and Jen and find out more at thelifeloveandmoney.com.